Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. You're listening to a new The Hacker Factory podcast with hacker maker, Philip Wiley. You're about to discover what the role of a professional hacker entails, the different specializations it holds, and what it takes to learn and become one. Enjoy the conversation as Philip and guests unveil the secrets of professional hacking, a mysterious, intriguing, and often misunderstood occupation. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Hacker Factory podcast. Uh, This week, I'm happy to have Kyle O'Mara join me. I was on Kyle's podcast a couple of years ago. We know each other from the community. Great person and, and has a really cool background that uh, I'm sure you all will find useful. And uh, it's good to bring people on. You know, when I started the show, I was mainly bringing on people that were in the offensive security field, you know, hence the name, the hacker factory. But as things went on, I saw the need to to bring on people from other areas because, you know, not everyone wants to be a pen tester and and people need to be aware of the other areas. And so uh, it's great to have you join today, Kyle. Appreciate it, Philip. It's great to be here. And uh, I appreciate you reaching out and asking me to be on. You're welcome. Should have done it sooner, but it's just, you know, being connected with the security community, you know, you, you'll finally see someone, oh yeah, I need to get them on there. Sometimes you forget to reach out. And one of the things I did was make sure to do that immediately so, so I didn't forget and have to try to remember to follow back up. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. so how's your... So how's your new year going? So far, so good. Took, you know, some time off during the holidays to, you know, uh, reset. And that was great. And, you know, back at it since, you know, the beginning of the year. And, you know, busy in my job role. Uh, always busy. There's never a dull moment. And there's also always stuff to do and to not only track down, but also, like, refresh your memory on and, and dig into a little bit more, or, you know, there's never like you know i think in our field with nice it's like you're never like oh there's nothing to do i mean there's always something you could probably you know uh, look into a little bit more go back to see if you can find something different you know so forth and so on very cool so why don't you share with uh, with the listeners uh your story your your background and how you got started yeah i mean uh, turn back the clock a little bit so like you know i think I, as everybody else everybody was always a tinker i can't Unlike a lot of people in our community, I can't recall like the first computer I had. I just remember it being, having like, I think an IBM computer. So for me, it was more about playing games like Doom and getting on AOL and talking to people, uh, AOL and some messenger back in the day. And like, I don't think I really got that niche to like do computer like things till I got to college, uh, and gotten to, uh, I think really what sparked it is I had it in, um, an, uh, RA on my floor that was in his computer science department. And he would, he built a supercomputer out of Xboxes. Um, this guy ended up going on and starting his own company and doing fuzzing stuff. And I think his company was recently bought by Accenture. So like, it's just interesting how that all plays out and keeping connected that way. But that's what sparked my interest. And then I think I changed majors from doing like criminal justice type things. I always wanted to kind of go work for a three letter agency and do that type of work. And then um, switching majors to computer science, ended up switching schools and still doing sort of a information technology type degree at the school I transferred to. And then did a lot of that from, you know, digital media stuff. I was really into like uh, making art on Macs and, and doing website design and things like that, but also like the networking side of stuff and tinkering that way. Worked for an ISP while I was in undergrad for a few months. That was an interesting time dealing with uh, help desk. And I think that's where I really got my first role in like what we call help desk and with dial up customers, them calling in and saying, why did you uh, stop my internet on my computer and try and troubleshoot that? And then, uh, so that, you know, it, I think what after that, that was what really kind of got me going. And then, you know, I was graduating in uh, college, I think sort of on the cusp of a recession. So didn't, couldn't find a job out of college, didn't want to do, was considering going to, you know, OCS in the army or uh, in the air force, bounce around that idea, didn't do that. And then it was one of those days where it was like a beautiful spring day and uh, Carnegie Mellon University was coming to do a, uh, you know, sort of information session on campus uh, at my undergrad. 
And it was like, do I go to that or I sit on the porch and, you know, have a beer, right? You know, and, uh, you know, wavering back and forth. I'm glad I went to that information session. I ended up going into a, you know, master's program at Carnegie Mellon uh, University doing basically like what we would call cybersecurity now, but my degrees like in what I think were their earlier stages before the verbiage was changed of information assurance, um, you know, some management classes, some IT management classes, a lot of deep, you know, cybersecurity type classes. And then uh, came out of that rate in the 2008 recession and couldn't find a job, was in a scholarship for service program, which is a uh, National Science Foundation program where they pay for your school, but then you owe time back to public service. A great program if those that really they want to get in public service. Uh, so I owed two years back to public service, whether that was state, local, federal, or, uh, um, and, uh, was trying to find a job, trying for nothing. Like people wanted to hire you, but they just didn't have the budget given the time of the, uh, what was going on that time. And then, uh, ended up landing a job at NSA and was there for, almost five years doing what I would still call like threat hunting type of roles um, in a vast variety of, you know, different type of threat hunting type roles. And then got to that point where I thought the grass was greener on the other side, thought I could make more money doing, you know, uh, going into the consulting world, did the consulting thing for about a year, <laughs> barely made it, realized it wasn't for me, but it was uh, what I always used to tell my students is figure out what you don't like for you uh, figure out what you do like. So realizing early on in my career, consulting type of jobs weren't for me. And I, that's when I was doing like digital forensic instant response, which is an exciting type work, but at the same time, super stressful. Uh, so hat tips to even all those uh, uh, peers out there that do digital forensic instant response now, the not knowing if you're going to have your weekend and things like that, that just, that's an anxiety that I cannot live with. Um End up going into uh, working at FireEye, but contracted back to NSA doing more threat hunting type jobs, a uh, job. And then, um, you know, it was kind of, uh, you know, I get more or less done with the DC area. I felt like I, you know, uh, it was expensive to live down there. Didn't want to live far away. So I was looking back in the Pittsburgh area at um, Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering, Engineering Institute. Uh, which is a federally funded research and development center like MIT Lincoln Labs and Sandia and Oak Ridge and, and similar to all those. Um, so end up landing a job there doing more threat analysis, threat hunting type roles. And then uh, it's been over five years there. And then uh, at the end of 2020, uh, it, most of 2020 I was applying to jobs, uh, applied to Drago's, uh, didn't get it the first time. Uh, applying to a bunch of different other places, um, got exhausted with applying and interviewing and that stress. And then it was like, ah, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to ride this out for a while and see what happens. But if like Dragos calls again, you know, or comes up on the radar, maybe I'll apply. And sure enough, it was like, you know, the universe heard me. I got a, literally a, a email like a couple of days later after I said that to my wife. And uh, yeah, I've been at Dragos for over two years now doing, you know, threat hunting type roles, specifically in the niche of like, you know, critical infrastructure, industrial infrastructure, OT uh, type roles. So, and in the mix there, I guess I taught for a while too, grad school and undergrad courses as oh, cool. well. Yeah. Drago seems like it'd be a, a cool place to work for, you know, some cool folks there, you know, Leslie Carhart and, and uh, Robert Lee. So seems like it'd be a cool place. It's a, it's a great culture. We have a great culture, great group of people, smart people all around. Uh, the, uh, the culture is really great. And I, I love working for Dragos. Yeah. It seems like it'd be a really good place. Some sharp individuals to learn from. And, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And really there's, good. I'm sorry. Good. No, I say absolutely. Like that's the best part is like, you know, you can, there's, we have so many people that are subject matter experts and things like, you just never would think of that. Like, you're like, Hey, can you explain like how electric distribution works from like the, you know, network level? We have people that can do that. Same in the manufacturing and water. It's just, it's like, uh, it's super exciting. Cause you're like, if I want to learn in, and most of us have to try to experience and learn about that. Like you just, there's so many people you can ask and bounce ideas off of them. Like, am I understanding this correctly? And so it's great. Yeah. Good area to be in too, because it, and it's good to see people starting to take, OT, ICS, and critical infrastructure seriously, because, you know, that's really a vulnerable 
vulnerable area that we definitely need to make sure we're protecting. Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, as the slogan of the company is safe ground civilization, it's like we all want lights and, you know, running water and power and things like that. And I think that's, it's, uh, makes the job somewhat more exciting to be able to be on that cutting edge to help protect that. And so what's kind of, uh, you know, kind of share with our listeners, they may not be familiar with OT and ICS. If you could kind of explain that and kind of explain some of the unique risks with those compared to our traditional IT infrastructures. Yeah, I think how uh, Rob, our CEO, explains it. It's like when you mix normal computers with physics, right? So, uh, you know, valves and, and different types of, you know, it's even down to food and beverage environments like conveyor belts and uh, temperature sensors and things like that. So those networks typically, you know, still have network connections and, and they're running software that interoperates with those things. And unfortunately, a lot of networks are still not segregated properly and segmentation is a big thing to consider. Uh, so, you know, uh, as, as we've seen in the events that have occurred and even, you know, the uh, event in uh, the spring of last year um, that, uh, was discovered that targeting the, uh, electric distribution in Ukraine, right? And we've seen that before in Ukraine and the blackout in, in, uh, in 2016 and 2015. Like, so those events, it's like, you know, the knowledge to understand those environments is, uh, has to be very niche, but like the catastrophic events of just, you know, what can happen by changing commands or changing a valve or shutting down something, what the ripple effect of that is. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's that finding those, you know, uh, adversaries doing that and what the techniques they're using and trying to stay ahead of that and understanding of what they're trying to understand as well is, uh, makes it very interesting and a different thought process and, and different impact. I think is sort of how I look at it is like the impact of shutting down a system in the operational technology environment versus shutting down a system in the IT environment, you know, that. The, the impact and the fallout of that is can be a lot greater and sometimes yes. you know life threatening right yeah definitely because you hear about it you know even though some of those factories if something fails someone could get injured get killed and uh, i worked briefly for a company that was a large consumer products company we had ot environments and i you know a lot of cases one of the things they were worried about is ruining products because they had stuff that uh, materials to make the products they were about, worried about that but there were some cases some machines if something happened someone could get injured or, or even killed in those situations yeah absolutely i mean it's just it, it, it's from everything from just changing the chemical and, and water right you know increasing the you know, fluoride and water like the catastrophic events of that if someone if like a system was exposed to internet um you know like that Oldsmart event that happened uh i think over a year ago right uh it may have been more than that you know a lot of events keep coming and going out of my head but you know, that system was on the internet. So, you know, whoever got access to it was able to manipulate some of the valve and that information on there. Right. So it's the interoperability of using those systems, but like also doing your best effort not to expose those systems, uh, to the internet. Right. And I think that's still, uh, a problem that, you know, we're hoping to, you know, uh, slow down and sort of get rid of at some point in time. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I know kind of like with one of our products, because we're the company I work for, we do external attack service management and they were viewing, reviewing, monitoring and discovering the uh, attack surface for a potential client. And there was like a PLC exposed to the internet. No kind of authentication required. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, you see, you saw a lot of this during the Ukraine Russia war, the back and forth, the pro Ukrainian hacktivists targeting infrastructure in Russia and vice versa. And, oh, um, just doing some research into that, like how many of those devices, even in the Russian IP space, like were just default creds that, you know, these hacktivists were just logging into and then not really understanding what they're doing when they, uh, you know, change things, right? Besides like, probably going to have to have someone come out and like manually reboot the device that they're, you know, they mucked with. Um, but the fallout of that, like what, you know, if they caused the fire or damage or burn down a building, right. That's when it turns into like 
you know, uh, the understanding of these devices, I think even I'm still learning every day. So when you see these from hacktivists to state sponsored groups doing it, it's like, did they take their due diligence to really figure out <laughs> what the effects of what they're doing is going to what the um, impact and what they might not care. Right. You know, it's just, it's, uh, you know, some of that motive goes away, I would assume in these certain times, but I think, uh, you know, just mucking with a device and, and, you know, just cause it's on the internet, you know, uh, and without understanding the fallout and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, almost like cost, uh, analysis of what you're doing is, uh, probably should pump the brakes a little bit cause you wouldn't want someone to do it to you. Yeah. And you got to think about people's lives too, you know, exactly. You, you really want to take that responsibility of injuring someone or possibly killing someone. Yeah. So you, you know, your type of role, the threat intel or threat hunting is kind of interesting. So it's not something most people hear about, you know, they always hear about the pen testing role. Everyone wants one would be hackers, but this is one of those areas that I think if I had to go back and choose something else, threat hunting would be very, very interesting. So if you kind of explain what that role entails. Yeah, I think it's it, it's somewhat a little bit different depending on where you are, whether you're a threat hunter at an organization inside of SOC doing that type of role. So you're hunting for malicious activity on your network, on your corporate network, right? In a uh, security operations center and, you know, identifying things on your corporate network and what's going on. In, and then the other one is like, identifying uh, adversary activity, targeting uh, different networks on the outside, right? So using tools, uh, all your different sources and methods you can to identify, you know, activity that might be targeting something. So for us at Dragos, we're looking for activity targeting like, you know, ICS, ICS and OT entities, right? So it's a little more niche and, uh, but, you know, it's just the same as, you know, uh, bank entities looking for those, th you know, adversaries targeting financial uh, infrastructure as well. So it's, you know, uh, from what the, I think the simplest way to break it down and the method we use and uh, my former um, boss was one of the, the co-creators is a diamond model. And, and, you know, if you read the diamond model paper, it gets very technical and in depth about it, but at the simplistic, you know, abstract it all the way out, you're kind of looking at who the adversary is, what their capabilities are, what their infrastructure is, and who they're targeting, right? So um, when you're doing any type of threat hunting, you're trying to identify probably the capabilities. You're probably identifying some of the infrastructure. If you're in a SOC, you're obviously, you are the target, right? So you have that. And then sometimes knowing the adversary is, is good and bad, it doesn't really matter. I think the ability to identify a attack and what type of malware is going on and to be able to mitigate that or uh, defend against that, you know, and the same si same thing goes for infrastructure itself, and be able to identify adversary infrastructure that's associated with the capabilities that might be targeting you as well. So it's a little bit, you know, different depending on where you sit, but it's you know, a little bit of strategic, a little bit of operational, a little bit of tactical, tactical, uh, you know, when you're looking at uh, what and what's going on. So if someone wanted to start a career in threat hunting, how would you recommend them learn, learn that skill, how to prepare for that type of a role? Yeah, I would say, you know, networking's good. Understanding networking is, I think, a, a plus. Um, I think understanding what malware is and, and, and at the high level, how malware works. You don't need to be a reverse engineer if that's not what interests you. But understanding networking, I think, is a great aspect and, you know, how that works and how different protocols work, whether it's your typical IT environment protocols, or if you want to work in, in the, the uh, you know, ICS OT space and OT protocols and how those work. So, uh, networking and, and, uh, you know, the protocols associated with it, like the malware, like how it, you know, not necessarily like in depth reverse engineering, but what it's doing on the system. What are some of the TTPs, you know, using, uh, the MITRE attack framework is a great, uh, way to break it down, uh, as well as, you know, using that as an aspect of, can you lay out uh, an incident on there, right? How did they get in? What was the initial, uh, infection vector, right? Was that a spear phishing email? Was it a vulnerable system on the internet? Was it a vulnerable network perimeter device on the internet? Um, 
I think those are sort of the, the two things. Like I always go back to network. I think if you understand networking, you can go and do a lot of different types of jobs. So I feel like understanding networking and how that works in different protocols, you can expand upon there to from going investigating network traffic to investigating host-based incidents that a lot of digital forensics and incident response uh, user uh, practitioners might do, as well as like if you work in a SOC, you might be looking at those type of events. So I think understanding your host base systems as well, you know, what, what a Windows system looks like, what a Linux system works like, and start there, I think, is some of the simplistic things. So it's doing threat hunting on a Linux system, uh, doing threat hunting on a Windows system, where some network traffic. And you can do all this, and I think in, you know, virtual machines, even free versions, right? Fire up a Windows system, you know, if you change a registry key, what things are logged, right? You know, or if you even want to yeah. just, you know, capture traffic between your system and another system, what's you browsing the internet look like? So be able to see browsing traffic. And then from there, you can extrapolate like, oh, what command and control from an adversary traffic might look like, right? And what they might be doing and what type of things are associated with that network traffic. So I think um, those are some of the like high level skills I would start with. And that's sort of how I... I always broke down my class sort of when I used to teach like a threat applied threat analysis class my wife and I co-created was like kind of using the kill chain, the Lockheed Martin kill chain. Like you have your, it, and using that as sort of a mapping of developing the class. So you have your, uh, you know, how they get in, what kind of exploits they might be using. Are they doing spear phishing? So they're doing malicious documents and then the malware itself. And then what do they do when they're on the network? Are they moving laterally? What's, what protocols can they use to move laterally? And then what is their actions on the objective? Sort of what do they plan to do next? Is this collect all the things they want to collect and then exfil the data out? What, you know, what have adversaries done to exfil it? So it's almost, that's sort of the model that we built our class around because it was sort of the attack path of what an adversary would take. So I think highlighting some of those things and using that as sort of your baseline to be like pick and choose different things associated with that, uh, the kill chain will help you find gaps in your skills and find things you're really interested in as well. So are there, are there any threat hunting entry level jobs or does someone need to start out in a SOC first or would you recommend spending time in a SOC to help gain skills that would be helpful in? in I think hunting? that, I think that's a fair, I think doing that, you know, uh, but then there's also, I think there are at Threat, uh, you know, entry level jobs, lots, lots of different vendors out there because if they have a lot of, um, first party data, you know, such as companies like Proofpoint that have a lot of email data, right? Or, you know, their crowd strikes and the Mandians that have like a lot of endpoint data or other incident response data, right? Like, so that's sort of threat hunting itself there. You get this data, you have to analyze the data you have to figure out what happened, right? I think that's any type of investigation. Um, and I think that's sort of how I would boil down like threat hunting. So the, I think those jobs exist other places. And I think some of the skill sets that you come in with could be applicable. I think one of the things we don't talk a lot about, because we're always looking for those technical, technical, technical skill sets is like communication skills. So be able to uh, present, do webinars, but also write reports and then write reports at different levels for different people. So whether it's a strategic report that only executives at a company who might be your customers might care about. So they're not going to care about how they exploited the network. They just want to know what exploit was used and what devices were targeted. And then, or, you know, when you're writing a report that is technical, you're getting down to, you know, the bits and bytes and like what the malware looked like and what the C2 looked like going out of the network and what files they might have touched and what log files they might have created. So being able to write, I think, is and, be, and being very concise and not, you know, verbose and get to the point and write that information down, I think is one of the things that I also like to try to uh, do um, for the students as well as to understand that. Yeah, it's important to understand those parts too, because I think a lot of cases people want to be pen testers. And I think if they saw some had to write the reports, they may not like it as well, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's uh, so yeah, it's good that, you know, for them to, to understand that and, and the whole communication things I strongly agree, agree on. I think it's really helpful nowadays too, because we live in an age that people communicate virtually so much. So interacting with people in, in person. So I think, you know, as you mentioned, webinars, maybe even people speaking in person and going to different meetups and communicating people will build those skills because you may 
may be lacking those skills just from kind of the, the way today's world is. Oh yeah, I agree. I think especially in your career. I mean, I think we all can take advantage of it as at any point in our career, but yeah, like be able to engage with people and have all types of conversations with people. So yeah, leveraging those meetups that you have in your cities and your areas and any type of smaller conferences that might exist and things like that are it definitely could benefit you. And that's, you know, networking, right? Like that's also meeting these different people might land you your next job. Very good. So what about, I mean, this is kind of a little different area, you know, like in pen testing, sometimes people pursue certification. Sometimes they be, can, can be helpful. Is there anything in, in that realm that's helpful as far as certifications? Is it something required? Is it, you know, is it uh, something as neat as much like maybe in pen testing certifications in that area? Yeah. So I've always had a, like a strong opinion of this. I think it's whatever, in my opinion, is whatever works for you. And I think there's a vast variety of different people put certifications on stuff. There's obviously some that are more uh, community known and, but they also might cost a lot more for individuals to get. So I think at the end of the day, you know, the certification on your resume will help, but the knowledge you'll gain from taking the course, whether it's a free course, whether it, it doesn't, you know, it's a industry you know, widely accepted course, I think is what I think how you have to look at it. You know, I used to say certifications didn't matter. And obviously to some people they do and some people like them and some people use that as like their, you know, continue education and to build their knowledge. And maybe they didn't go to school for this and they're doing a career change. So it does matter uh, to them, you know, for, you know, standing with degrees. It's whatever fits your needs and your budgets and your desires. And, you know, though you might not have all the certifications as someone else that might be applying, but if you can still ace that interview just as well as someone that has the certifications, you know, uh, and you're going against like that type of individual and you're, the only difference is they had the certifications you don't, but you did better in the interview because you still knew the material and understood all the questions they asked. Then that that's a win for you at the end of the day. So I think, you know, in threat hunting, there are some different ones. I think there's, I saw there's a sock, uh, one out from offensive security, one that's nearly brand new. There's a bunch from SANS courses, uh, threat, threat intelligence academy from uh, my former boss, Sergio. He has uh, some courses doing for threat analysis and certifications that way. So I think there's a vast variety. I think it's just whatever fits your needs. It's just do it. You know what I mean? And, and, you know, fits your needs and your budgets and your desires. You know, whatever, you know, if you have the cost to pay for the one that's more industry standard and you have the budget for that, then sure, go for it, do it. You know what I mean? But if it, all the other free courses that you can get on all the other platforms that exist out there and YouTube videos, I mean, YouTube University, what my wife likes to joke about is like, there's tons of people giving it free information out there. So use all the resources that you find value in and that help you get to where you want to go and what your goals are. That's great. And nice thing about the stuff if you, you get for free, you don't waste money because maybe you get into something, realize you don't like it, or maybe it, you know, you can run across stuff because, you know, Udemy has some stuff, but some things are good, but you have to be careful because not everyone is an expert and you may be getting misinformation. So, but yeah, I mean, that to, that's also building another skill. Take your time to research. If you're taking the free courses, Look up the person, do your own, you know, OSINT investigation of the person. Where have they worked? What have they done so that they're providing that information? Hopefully you can do enough. Oh, they worked here, here, and here. I know those companies. I know other people that work there. Oh, that, they probably have an idea of what they're talking about. And, or, you know, as we all do is don't use a single source. Don't single source anything, right? If you've got to go yeah. learn about reverse engineering from this person, go look up reverse engineering from another person as well. Even if it's an introduction to the same type of course, but they either going to, they're going to align or they're not going to align. And then you're going to find the gaps. You'll have to go find a third source to figure out what information is more, might be more valuable. So yeah. And it's just like, don't single source your, your learning either. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I, I had a case where, uh, I was teaching at another college, but I had someone reach out to me to teach at this other college and it paid considerably better. And I got through the technical interview and the next phase was to go through here's this presentation you need to teach like a one hour lecture based on this in the book, the class was based on, I just went to Amazon and downloaded it anyway, just went ahead and bought the book to see more details. And this was like the co comprehensive guide to pen testing or ethical hacking. And 
I don't even think it was a hundred pages. I think it's 50 or 60 pages. I'm thinking it's not very comprehensive. <laughs> Look back at the credentials of people wrote it. The guy that wrote the book had wrote books on using Microsoft office, different software suites, nothing related to security. And then the other person to help co-write the book was basically just a writer. So saw that. I said, yeah, I'm totally going to discount that because they could have researched that, but you know, you have to hope that the research is good. And whenever they're overselling as some comprehensive guide and it's only 50 to 80 pages, I don't think that's very comprehensive. Agreed. And I think times are very different. And I think they're in favor of people that are starting out or switching careers now because the vast variety of information back when I started, you know, my journey into, even when I was in grad school, you know, from 2006, to 2008, you know, you had forums and you had a few books that exist, like the Hacking Exposed books were like in their first editions out there. And, uh, you know, those were good, but those were your only sources of information in, in book format. And everybody was off to get them because there were information on the internet just didn't exist as vastly as it did eventually mm -hmm. as, you know, the turn of like the 2010s, I think, you know, came to be. But like now it's just like you have information everywhere. So, Start with the free sources. Don't single source it. Uh, dig into things. And like you said, what makes it, you, you hit the nail on the head. You said you get all the free sources. You can figure out what you don't like. So you don't spend money on something that you think you're going to like. Right. You know, so it's, that's where the, the silver lining win is, is that you find the free sources. You test that. You're like, I don't like that. Good thing I didn't buy that expensive course to do the certificate in because. No, that would might look good on my resume. I just would never want to do that. So would I ever want to put that on my resume type of thing? Yeah, great advice. So we're getting down towards the end of the show. Is there anything you'd like to share that we didn't discuss? I don't think so. I think, you know, just, I think stay hungry, figure out what you don't like along the way. Um, reach out to anybody in the community. I think that's the nice thing about this InfoSec community is that majority of people are open for DMs everywhere, I think I get, you know, one a month from someone and always open to, you know, working out of time to then, you know, sit down and chat, whether it's just via the messaging or, uh, you know, in an email or over a Zoom call or whatever it might be, um, or if you're local, you know, in person. So I think it's what's fruitful is to leverage that, those community uh, people, if you have further on questions and then reach out to people as needed. Uh, great advice. So thanks for, for joining. I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to, to be on the podcast. Absolutely, Philip. It's great. It's great to catch up again. Hopefully uh, we'll cross paths, you know, physically some conference sometime soon. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to make sure to to keep you on my radar because did you go to Black Hat or DEF CON? Yeah, I, was, uh, I, I did Black Hat uh, just quickly for another type of podcast. And I was at, I always go to DEF CON. Uh, yeah, I always try to attend that just more from the fact, like we kind of talked about before the podcast started, just the networking alone, meeting up with people they haven't seen. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, my wife and I love Vegas. We got married in Vegas, a real wedding in Vegas on a white chapel wedding, but a real wedding so in no. Vegas. So we, we love Vegas and just hanging out and going to eat good and, and meeting up with people and going to dinner and drinks and things like that. It's fun. Well, cool. I hope to, to run into you then. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you on the next episode. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Hacker Factory podcast with Philip Wiley. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share ITSBmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.